Anybody hear me? Can y'all hear me? No? Can y'all hear me now? Can everybody hear me? All right. I think it's time we're getting started. You can't hear me? Yeah, I'll talk louder. <laughs> I like the temperature, Charlie. You did good. So we got some visitors today. I'd like to welcome y'all. Uh, appreciate y'all being here. And I want to welcome y'all back anytime you can be here. Uh, this is not my class. This is Eddie Ray's class. But Eddie Ray is with the teens at camp. So I'm filling in for him. And I'm going to try to just pick up right where he left off. And uh, he gave me uh, his notes. So I'm going to use my notes and his. So hopefully when he comes back, y'all are right where you should be. Um, studying the book of James uh, in chapter 4. And we're going to start with verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Um, depending on which translation you have, uh, you'll have some variation of uh, you adulterous people or you adulterers or you adulteresses, uh, all implying unfaithful people. Uh, if you haven't been in the class, you haven't been studying James, that 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 term, you adulterous people, that might not kind of shock you. Um, if you've been in the class with Eddie, uh, you've noticed that in the first three chapters, uh, James has been addressing the 12 tribes, which is who the, the, the book is written to, the 12 tribes, or Jewish Christians, uh, as brothers and sisters, brethren, or beloved brethren. And if you go back to uh, chapter 1, Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And then in uh, 16, verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. And then in 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Down in verse 5, listen, my dear brothers. And then in verse 14, what good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? And then in chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And then in verse 10 of that same chapter, uh, My brothers, uh, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers, this should not be. And then in verse 12, My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapefruit bear figs? And then... Chapter four, verse, chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people. Uh, seems a little harsh. Why did, why did James go from my brothers, my beloved brethren, my brethren to you adulterous people? Does anybody have a theory on that? No? He had just covered uh, the first three verses, which you all talked about last week, uh, going through why they, why, why they fight and quarrel amongst each other. Uh, they kill and covet for the things they want. Um, you quarrel and fight. Um, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And I think that's what, that's what led him to address them in that way. Um, going to Eddie's notes. Uh, in the Greek, uh, the, the phrase that was used seemed to imply feminine adultery. Uh, and so the, the NAS, which is what Eddie has here, uh, says you adulteresses. didn't say you adulterous people. But like I said, depending on your translation, you have a different variation of that. Uh, feminine adultery, and, and the example Eddie gave was a wife breaking the covenant with her husband. Uh, in Jeremiah 3.20 is the example he had. Let me go to that. Jeremiah 3.20. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you have been unfaithful to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. So the imagery that we see here uh, should be familiar. That we see that in Scripture a lot, and it's um, God's relationship with the Israelites, God as the husband, 
to the Israelites, the wife. Uh, you see that throughout, uh, throughout Scripture. And the reference he gave me for that is Isaiah 54, 5 through 6. Four, five through six. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife, deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. Do we see that relationship in the New Testament as well? If you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And Eddie mentioned here that uh, he says, I think, I think this speaks to us in a very deep level, especially to a man. Um, your love, your wife betrays you. I would imagine it's the same for a, a woman who's betrayed by a man or uh, anyone who's betrayed by someone they love or who they trust, that same sense of betrayal. And brothers fuss and fight, right? Right. But we still love each other. And, and in this first part of chapter 4, these things, coveting and, and um, asking for things, one of them not because you're willing to share, it's all selfishness. Right. Um, and that seems to be where a lot of this comes from, even among brothers. And that's what he talked about last week, uh, chapter 4, the first three verses, is what he covered, uh, that, that he arrived at that. But does everyone see, the, uh, everyone see the relationship between God and the Israelites and Jesus and the church as a husband-wife relationship? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's shown that way throughout the, throughout the scripture. Uh, and then Eddie points out, uh, talking about the betrayal uh, of a wife, um, you, see that, you see this in secular writings as well, and uh, the example he gave me was Dante's Inferno. Is anybody familiar, familiar with Dante's Inferno? Has anybody ever studied that? Rachel, you raised your hand. Have you read that in school? Okay. Anybody else? A couple people? Okay. I, I had researched it a little bit for a previous sermon I did on the devil, um, but I had to go a little deeper to get to Eddie's point. Um, if you don't know, Dante's Inferno is the first part of a, a 14th century poem called the Divine Comedy. Um, <clears throat> and in it, hell is depicted as nine concentric circles of torment. Uh, and they start off bad, and they just get progressively worse as they go down uh, to the ninth circle. Uh, and that ninth circle is uh, betrayal. Um, so. You go from lust to envy to gluttony and things like that. And uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom uh, is, is uh, betrayal. Uh, and it just generally increases in wickedness as it goes down. Uh, <clears throat> and the most famous inmate in this poem, the most famous inmate of the betrayal circle is Judas Iscariot. Now, that's not scripture. That's a poem. Um, it's, it's secular. Uh, and, then, and then the last circle the smallest one would be where the devil is, is in prison, is, is in chains. Um, <clears throat> so back to my original question. Uh, why, why, do you think, why do you think he went from brothers, brethren, my brethren, to you adulterous people? Dan kind of touched on it. Uh, why do you all think he did that?
And he says James is calling them out as liars or betrayers, leaving their real love for the world, becoming friends with the world, and hostile or an enemy to God. And, and I would have to believe, with, uh, I'd have to agree with Eddie's cl- uh, conclusion on that. Uh, but James ends his thoughts by reminding them of God's desire for them, that he is jealous. He is a jealous God. I'm going to go to James 4, 5. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? He says the Scripture says without reason. Um, I have no idea what Scripture he's talking about. Uh, I've researched it. I can't find it. Um, If you go to other translations, of that scripture, it, you just get different variations, but you never do, you never can find that scripture. I've, I've searched it, uh, and it's not there. Normally when someone says, the scripture says, you'll, you'll get a scripture and you can trace that back, it's usually back to the Old Testament. Um, but, but this particular scripture, uh, it, it's not in there. Eddie, uh, Eddie uses the, I guess he uses the New American Standard. Um, Let me see here. Mine says, uh, the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely. That's four or five. Uh, The NAS, New American Standard, says the same thing, but it says it with quotation marks. So it's quoting that this is a a scripture. Uh, The ESV, I know some of you have that, that should say, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Is that, y'all agree with that? Is that what y'all says? Okay, and then, and then the New King James Version says the same thing and also has it in quotations as if he's referring to a scripture, most likely somewhere in the Old Testament. Um, but I can't find it. it. It's not out there. Um, so the commentators think that that's either a scripture from a now lost writing that we, we no longer have that, wherever he got that. Or it's just a summary of Old Testament teaching. But it is, it is quoted in there, which makes you, would lead you to believe that that is a scripture he got from somewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, but, but I couldn't find it. Um, the closest I could come to a scripture reference like that, uh, which is also the same one uh, Eddie had on his list, uh, would be Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And that's the Ten Commandments. Uh, That would be, um, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's the closest that I could get to that. And it's also the one Eddie used. Uh, Neither one of us could could find that actual quote. But there's still hope uh, because of his mercy and grace. Um, In chapter 4, verse 6, he says, but he gives us more grace That is why scripture says, again, he's quoting scripture, God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. And my interpretation, or my translation in Eddie's is the same. Um, And this is a partial quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, or it's another quote from another now lost source. A now, uh, now lost writing. Um, if you go to First Peter chapter five and verse five, which is a couple pages over. First Peter five five. Peter says, "Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble." And the only other place in the Bible I can find that scripture is back in James 4, 6. Uh, the commentators uh, attribute that to Proverbs 3, 4. But it's not the same. In any translation uh, that I've found, uh, and I kept a list of all the different translations What's that say? Yeah. 
Right. That is similar. But he quotes it. That is why a scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In Proverbs 3.34, in every other translation I, I can find, says he mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The Lord mocks the mockers. Toward the scorners, he is scornful. Um, and just different variations of that. He never says, I never, it's not in Proverbs of any, any translation I can find of Proverbs 3.34. It never says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And again, um, is that another one of those, is that another one of those lost uh, writings that we no longer have? Or was that another general, um, general statement, uh, a summary of Old Testament writing that he was saying? He wasn't an actual quote of a particular scripture. Could that have been him just generalizing, summarizing Old Testament teaching? I don't know. But I, I, I searched and I, I could not find that. What do you all think? Um, is that ESV? Yes. Okay, yep. Uh, NIV says... No, 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 no. American Standard. American Standard. And that's... that's uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's what uh, the NAS says. Therefore, it, they're, they're quoting therefore it says... Right. They're right. quoting something from somewhere. Yeah. And, and like I said, whichever, depending on which translation you go to, it either says it says or that is why scripture says. Uh, but it never says that first line, God opposes the proud. So it could be a summary. It could be summarizing all Old Testament teaching. Or it could be from some, some writing we just don't have anymore. Um, but it was obviously um, a well-known passage of scripture because Peter used it, right? And I don't think he got it from James, and I don't think James got it from Peter. Um, but if you mock the crown, aren't you opposing the crown? Yeah. Yeah. But which crown? Yeah. Is that, is that the original Greek? Maybe the original Greek may have said that, and the translations have changed it to, to, to scorning and, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to know somebody that knows Greek if the two passages are the same in Greek. Right. And that's the problem. I don't know Greek. Don't read Greek, don't speak Greek. Um, but you would think there would be a note. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Also, uh, in Eddie's note, he mentioned that uh, James was very harsh uh, in verses 4 through 5, but he returns to a message of hope uh, and saying, despite your adulterous actions and friendship with the world, you do not have to fear God's wrath. Uh, his grace is more than sufficient to cover this sin of yours. Uh, you just need to recognize your position Humble yourselves, repent, and return to God. Uh, God abounds in grace and mercy for those who humble themselves before him. And what, what a message of hope uh, for all of us. So if we go down to verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hand, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So, James is going back to the name-calling, kind of. Uh, you adulterous people, you sinners, you double-minded. But he's, he's, he's telling them that they have hope. No matter what they've done, there is still hope. And that's what Eddie was, that's what Eddie was pointing out um, that despite, despite your actions and friendship, you don't have to fear God's wrath because of his grace. 
uh, if, if you will, humble yourselves, repent and return to God. And he was talking to, he was talking to Jewish Christians. He wasn't just talking to non-believers. He was talking to those who had converted from uh, the old law to the new law. Um, but they're still sinners, and they still, have, they still need grace, uh, as we all do. Um, Don wasn't going to be here today, so he actually wanted to make sure he was able to comment on this. So he, he gave me his comment last week. Uh, and Don said, uh, uh, verse 7 tells us how to fix the problems in the first six verses of chapter 4. And uh, I'm going to go to Ephesians, back to Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, 21 through 24. Submit, your, uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So, not only do, do we submit to God, we submit to each other. Uh, we submit to our spouses, right? Do we submit on a regular basis? I think we do. Uh, we submit to our preacher. We, we listen to him. We listen to his sermon. Um, we, have to, we have to follow along, I think, uh, to make sure that, that everything we're hearing is correct because we do make mistakes. Uh, standing up in front of a crowd, it's real easy to make a mistake and say the wrong thing. Um, so it's it's good to be, it's good to be checked. And 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 in that case, if somebody comes back at me with something I said, I'm going to submit to them and listen to what they have to say because I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, but we submit to our spouses. The Bible talks about the wives submitting to their husbands. Do wives do husbands submit to their wives in anything? Daily daily right there's some things they do better than we do right um, so yeah keep going um, and that did, did I read 25 earlier uh, oh I stopped did I stop at 24 um, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Yeah, I did do that. I did do that when I was comparing the relationship between uh, God and the Israelites and Jesus and the church. Yeah, I read 25 through 27, but I'll do it again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church. And then if you were to continue to go down, uh, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Uh, he who loves his wife loves himself. Um, so, yeah. Context that we don't read that. Yes. We don't put it all together. Right. It's real, yeah, it's real easy to take and choose which scripture you're going to use to make your point. And to couple submission to each other. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's the only way it's going to work. Um, I think another reason for the way he speaks to everybody is it's easy for me to, to see things that you do and say, yeah, you need to fix that or whatever. But he starts calling me uh, an adulteress or whatever. Especially if I have any respect for the person who's talking to me, I start to think about, you know, what way, wait, wait, and, and can I um, reconcile that in my mind or not? Uh, but it's easy to see it in other people, much more difficult to see it in myself. And when somebody blatantly says it, then it's like, oh, right. Know, that's and that's, yeah. in your eyes. right. And that's 
Yeah, and I think that comes up again in James. Um, yes, later on, later on in chapter four, uh, you're talking about judgment. Yeah, that's coming up. Don't know if we'll get there, but it's coming. Um, so. What does it mean to submit? What do you think the definition of submit is? You may have an opinion on submission. Think of like in, what? like fighting when you submit, like you've given up the other person. That, that is one definition. The other person is totally in control. So you, yeah. Look at submitting Jesus or your spouse is like the same thing. I mean, you're you're totally powerless. They're they're in control. Yep. lowering yourself uh, kind of the vision I get is prostate, prostrating yourself in submission uh, I looked it up this, the Google definition is that accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person um, and that would be like to capitulate or surrender which is what you're kind of talking about and then I looked it up. Kim's got an old Webster's, I think, probably from when she was in college because it was dated 88. And it, it, actually, I was thinking I would, huh? I was thinking I would get a better definition from Webster than I would from Google. But it was actually, uh, there was really wasn't much of a difference. So I just, I kept that one. Um, and then if you notice in verse 7, uh, starts off with submit yourself then to God. It's a list. There's 10 commands in there from verses 7 through 10. There are 10 commands. Uh, and, and my note says that uh, the original Greek uh, implies that they're calling for immediate action in rooting out the sinful attitude of pride. The first one um, is verse 7, submit to God. Uh, humble yourselves and turn your life over to him. Uh, so he kind of, from four through six, he kind of chewed them out a little bit, uh, then gave them some hope, and now he's telling them what they have to do in order to get back in God's grace. Um, the second one, which is also in verse seven, is resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, and that reminds me of Ephesians 6. Is everybody familiar with Ephesians 6? I mean, I don't, I don't mind reading it, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it if we don't have to. Is everybody, is everybody good with Ephesians 6? Putting, putting on the whole armor of God? I don't mind reading it if I need to. Um, Ephesians 6, 11 through 18 talks about putting on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And that's what he says here. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. A couple of, chap couple of pages. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And so as a Christian, you're going to be, uh, the devil is going to try to persuade you to do things that you know you're not supposed to do, but you can resist him. Uh, so do we have scriptural evidence uh, of someone success successfully resisting the devil? Is there any? Scripture that y'all can think of, just off the top of your head, where someone <coughs> resists the devil. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Matthew four and Luke four all tell the same story. Uh, Matthew four uh, one through eleven. 
Mark just mentions that it happened. He doesn't go into any detail. But uh, Matthew and Luke both do. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, and now the <coughs> devil is quoting scripture, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus replied, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. He's asking Jesus to submit to him. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. The devil left him, just as James says, and Peter, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will leave. So we don't, uh, we don't, I don't think any of us actually see the devil when we're being tempted, right? got a voice in your head telling you to do something you know is wrong. That's, at least that's the way it works for me. I don't know if anybody else has seen the devil. Um, you may have seen someone you thought was the devil. Uh, you very possibly could be. Um, there are some evil people out there. But usually it's, it's it, sometimes I have to wonder if it's me or him. And things pop into my mind and I think, I know that's, that's not right. Is that me? Did I come up with that on my own? Or? Is that the devil tempting me? Because we didn't, we don't, we don't see Satan face to face. I hope, uh, and, and we're tempted directly like that. I don't think, uh, I don't know anybody's been visited uh, personally. Um, but when those thoughts come into your head, uh, it, it may be hard to distinguish whether I came up with that on my own or the devil put that there. Um, And if you, if you notice the way Jesus did it, uh, he resisted the devil, uh, but he didn't do it. He didn't have to call down lightning from heaven to destroy the devil. He didn't open up a hole in the ground like God did to the Israelites and swallow the devil. Uh, he did it by the examples were given in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, 11 through 18. Uh, he stood his ground, which is in Ephesians 6, uh, and with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, uh, he resisted the devil. He resisted the devil by quoting scripture, right? It didn't take any kind of a miracle for him to resist the devil. The same with us. When we're tempted to do something we know is wrong, it doesn't take a miracle to not do it. It just takes you standing your ground, remembering what, you, what you've been taught, Right, um, and and remembering the scriptures, which is another reason Danny and I harp on the teenagers about studying their Bible, study your Bible, study your Bible, because if you don't know these things, you don't have you don't have that to recall in a time that you really need it. Um, and you see that Jesus knew it, of course, and it was it was all there for him. Everything the devil threw at him, he had an answer for it, and. Same goes for us. When the devil presents something to you that sounds appealing, because uh, it often does, um, the more you know about the scripture, the more you're going to be able to recall that and say, no, I know that's wrong. Um, and and I, remember the, I remember a particular scripture uh, about that. Because um, the devil has many schemes um, to get you to separate you from God, that's the goal, right? Uh, and especially Christians. Those who are not Christians are already separated. Doesn't have to work on them near as hard. But for us, um, just because we became Christians doesn't mean he's going to walk away and say, nah, I, I won't mess with them. You know, 
they're going to be too hard to break. But these other people over here, I can, I can break them. I can keep them doing what I want. No, he's, he's coming after us. This, this is all written to Christians. He's coming after Christians, right? Um, <clears throat> so do we have scriptural evidence of someone who wasn't the son of God resisting the devil? Yep. Job? We think alike. I wonder how that happened. Uh, is everybody familiar with the story of Job? How that happened? Job didn't, Job didn't have a face-to-face uh, with Satan. Uh, it was all arranged behind his back. Job chapter 1. Uh, in the land of Uz, or Uz, in the land of Uz, there was, lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Uh, he was the greatest man, and I'm, I'm skipping through here. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Uh, one day, the angels or sons of God, depending on your interpretation, uh, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And the devil, being very intelligent, says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So if you're familiar with the story, uh, Job is... It seems to be Job is living during the time of the patriarchs. Um, no one really knows the date of the writing, but they, they think, commentators think it was from way back, one of the older books of the Bible. Uh, all his livestock, he had a great, a great amount of livestock. Uh, all of that was uh, carried off. Uh, the Sabaeans attacked and carried off the livestock. Uh, his servants were put to the sword. Um, fire fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and the servants, um, the Chaldeans. Folk came in three raiding parties and carried off all his camels, put the other servants to the sword. And another messenger says, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. A mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they're all dead. So not only did he lose all his livestock, he lost his servants, and he lost all his children, which is about as bad as it can get, I think. Um, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Who would have done that? He just lost everything he had, including his children, and he fell down in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now, as I said, Job did not meet face to face with Satan, but this was Satan's work. I don't know if Job had knowledge of that being Satan's work, or he just saw it as God. God did it for whatever reason, but he didn't charge God with wrongdoing for that. He accepted it. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, uh, the angels, or sons of God, uh, met again, and Satan came again. Uh, God asked him where he's been. He tells him he's been roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Satan says, skin for skin, 
A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Again, that's the second time the devil says, I can make him curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So the first time, you can touch his possessions, you can touch his children, you can't touch him. Now, okay, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Which is what Satan said he was going to make him do. He was going to make him curse God. Job's reply, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, God did not sin in what he said. That's about the best example I could come up with of someone other than Jesus resisting the devil. The, the, the temptation um, to have cursed God was there. He had every reason uh, to be uh, extremely upset over what had happened. Um, but his faith was greater than his grief, right? Um, his wife told him, curse God and die, which probably dying would have felt pretty good at that point, I would think, after all he'd been through. And, and if, you, if you've read the book of Job, um, there's about 35 more chapters of pure misery, uh, suffering, um, some not so good advice from his friends. Uh, it doesn't get better until I uh, think about chapter 38 and then God, come, God, God comes back on the scene and, uh, and everything, everything goes back to even better than it was before for Job. But uh, I think we're going to stop there. I think we're out of time. So we're going to stop at, is that verse 7? I'll pass that on to Eddie and y'all can pick up where you left off. Uh, last week. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate the uh, comments. Always makes it e easier. Uh, we pray that you will give us uh, knowledge and wisdom that we might have a better understanding of it, that we might be better able to serve you. Lord, we pray that uh, you will be with those who are on the road traveling, that you will get them back here safely. Pray that you will be with those who are sick, that you will comfort and heal them, if it be thy will. We're especially thankful for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice he made on our behalf.